Hello, YouTuberverse. This is your personal astrophysicist. Coming up, Cosmic Queries edition of Star Talk. This one on X rays in the universe. This is Star Talk. I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. And today it's a Cosmic Queries X ray imaging astrophysics edition. You didn't think we had one of those, did you? Well, we did, because we have one of the world's experts in that very subject sitting with me right now. I've got with me Kim Arcand. Kim, welcome. Thank you. I gotta get your title correct here. <laughs> it's, it's a long one. Visualization and Emerging Technology Lead for the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. And they didn't just pull you out of the ether. You've got some chops. Uh, I'm holding your book called Magnitude, Scale of the Universe. And I love this, on the cover, it's got a mouse, a human brain, a bowling ball, a hot air balloon, and Earth. It's like, what scales are they? Where are they? <laughs> and you open the book, and it lays that stuff out. And it talks about when things are big and small and how to yeah. think about them relative to one another. And this is stuff we, we confront every day in modern astrophysics. Cool. How do you wrap your head around the scale of things? And you need a visualizer to know how to do it best, because otherwise we fumble ourselves trying to explain it. And so you, so so beautiful book. Thank you. And uh, thanks for bringing a copy here. And my co-host Chuck. Hey Neil, how are you? Welcome back to Star Talk. Absolutely, it's a pleasure. Yes. All right. And and you're tweeting at Chuck Nice Comic. Yes. Uh, and and you're Instagramming at Kimberly Cowell. Kim Kimberly Cowell K O W A L. It's mm. my maiden name. Just had to throw now, that one in you, there. You, <laughs> why, why you gotta do that? It's an old from an old Yahoo email. Don't ask. Oh, okay. So Kimberly Cowell. Ka yes. K, K O W A L. K K Kimberly Cowell. Ka Cowell. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but uh, since you're a visual person, yeah. Instagram, you we got I some kick ass Instagram. images. Yes. Yeah. So we're going to yeah. all look for that. That'd be fun. Yeah. So Ready? you got some questions for us, Jack. Absolutely. Let's do this. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, um, of course, uh, solicited questions from all over the interwebs. And uh, we've got some good, some good ones here, but we always start with a Patreon patron because mm -hmm. Patreon patrons give us money. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, and okay. uh, since right. we are cheap whores. I'm, I'm, um, I'm slowly getting used to that. Yeah, yeah you don't like that. Them. You don't like anything to do with money. No, no, just, just money. This was my idea. I'm like, give us money. We'll do whatever you want. <laughs> All right. <laughs> first question. All right, first question. What would be the most exciting find that you would have uh, via X-ray telescope? Like, what would be the piece de resistance, so to speak? This is what he says. Okay, and this is Jesus, who from from page from Patreon. Patreon, okay, Jesus. Well, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of. If you ask that question of a, a number of different people, there'd be a lot of different answers. Uh -huh. um, I think, like for me in general, with astronomy, you're making the images, so you get. I know, the, I know, I do. You I get do. top pick here. I get, I get top pick. It's too exciting. Yeah. Um, for me, just with my biology background, anything to do with finding life, possibility right. for life on on other planets. I mean, when I first started working for Chandra, um, exoplanets like weren't really a thing. Like mm. this was like late '90s, and it, they weren't really. I think maybe there were one or two discoveries yeah, at that yeah, at yeah, that the first time. First was 1995. Right. So, exactly. Yeah. So they're I mean, all the rage now. Yes, they are all the rage now. There's thousands of them, I yeah. think. And um, Chandra has some really interesting capabilities to study, especially the um, effects of the the host star and how that might have um, habitability issues with its, you know, children planets. Mm -hmm. So I think anything to do with exoplanets for me, that would be super exciting. So this is extra information brought to us by X rays. Yeah about these objects we already know yep. of. Right. How about objects that we would know nothing of were it not for their X-ray signature? So, what all would right. you put at the top of that list? Oh, all right, well, I think. Because really, your, your X-rays for exoplanets are supplementing sure. other data. They are helping the bigger puzzle. The bigger yes, puzzle. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Give me one where um, the X-rays are the only pieces mm -hmm. in the puzzle. Well, so I'm too much like a multi-wavelength astronomy Ooh. junkie here. Oh, wow. I, I, I Look can't. At that. I know. You're I asking can't. me to choose one of my children. That's exactly how <laughs> This I is I the feel. Sophie's choice. And I would never pick one of my kids over the other. Uh, okay. And they're listening, so I, I know that for a fact. So anyways, but yeah, I feel like these days it's all about how the different kinds of light 
um, are each one tool in the toolbox mm -hmm. of astronomy, right? Very yeah. good. And it's truly about how all of those pieces fit together. So X-ray astronomy complements really well with radio astronomy, with mm -hmm. optical. I mean, it's really, it's hard to pick just one. Okay. So this is the healthiest way to think about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That you are a cog in a wheel. Right. A puzzle piece to a larger, uh, uh, organized understanding of the universe. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, and with the addition of like gravitational wave science. A like whole that's new window. Yet that's a, more. Yeah. That's so a, multi-messenger gets exciting. I mean, there's mm. just, there's a lot to go there. So I can't just pick one. You can't pick okay. one. No, okay. All right. Can't do it. There you go. All right. There can't there just is. have one. Nope. There you have it. I like I like the <laughs> and, and, and are you showing off your cell phone here? Um, look at look, maybe. Look at that. It's beautiful. Okay. You, this your is cell phone. gorgeous. <laughs> so that's this a is skin. An image. That's a or, a, yeah. or a cover. It's a little case. It's a little, a little case. case. I mean, this is NGC six hundred two. It's a beautiful stellar evolution area. Baby mm -hmm. stars being born. It's a stellar and nursery. Stellar nursery. Stellar nursery yeah. Lots mm -hmm. of babies in there. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> you've got this. The purple is the X ray data from Chandra. Mm -hmm. And then there's also some infrared data from Spitzer and <laughs> Chuck. Are you making crying babies? That's my baby star. That's my baby star. <laughs> and I just randomly found this on Amazon one day, which was, I think, so cool. And I was like, I know that image. Because? Because, 602, because uh, I worked on it. You, were, you yeah. created that image. Right. Well, with a team. With I mean, team. nobody, yeah. one person sure. ever does anything. Sure, of course. So, right. Of yes. Course. That, you scientists are always so damn humble. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> well, you can't be otherwise we'll smack you down. Because you, yeah. you could be I wrong next be, week. Right, exactly. right. And you're in the doghouse. Right. Exactly. exactly. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, and you guys kind of <laughs> all know need Nature is always more clever than any of us. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there you have it. That's a, sure. Oh, I like that. Nature is always more clever than any of us. Oh, yeah. Completely agree. Yeah. And sometimes it's more clever than all of us combined. Wow. So, one thing, so just to 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 emphasize, your X-ray data is part of other data that's combined to make yes. that image. So multi-wavelength astronomy again at its best. This is, is kind of a great observatory classic with Chandra Hubble and Spitzer, right. um, mm -hmm. which I think is really beautiful and it just helps tell the story. You know, X-rays I think are thought right, so, so of. So Chandra's X-rays, right. yeah. Hubble is, is obviously optical, visible light, right. and um, Spitzer's infrared. Spitzer's infrared. So right. yep. two. Very different branches of the spectrum. Oh, very much. But yeah. combined to make one, one image, image as though right. our eyes could see that right. broadly. Right. right. So if you had uh, sensors in X rays, visible, and infrared, mm -hmm. like, you'd be able to put this all together. But, and, and, we, right. and you'd look up and you'd see that. You'd see right. that. Right. right. So if you were Predator, you could actually Predator enjoy could that. that. Or, right. or Jordy. Or Jordy LaForge or in Star Trek. Oh, yeah, Correct. That's right. Cool. Yeah. Cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you could tune that sucker up. Yeah, you know, and you know, Jordy had the opportunity not to be blind, and he turned it down. Really? Yeah, in an episode of Star Trek, you know. I miss that one. And I think it's because he actually saw your image. That's probably <laughs> it. Nice. <laughs> well, the thing is, we are practically blind when you consider how narrow is the slice of the electromagnetic spectrum Absolutely. our retina shows us. We are wow. practically blind. Wow. Yeah, we can see so little, just if, like if, a tiny if, sliver. You know, you you know, you you open a book and it has. The rainbow, you know, the colors of the rainbow, red, right. orange, yellow, Roy G. Biv. Right. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, blue indigo, blue. violet. Don't can't forget indigo. Yes, yes. Right. And so it fills the page. And then, but you look at the entire range. Right. And I'll recite that now. It goes from, from high energy to low energy. You go from gamma rays, right. x rays, ultraviolet. Right. Uh, violet, indigo. You do Roy G. Biv backwards, right? Mm -hmm. Violet, indigo, blue, green. Green, green. red. Yep. No, no, green. Uh, uh, yellow, orange, or uh, orange, yellow, red. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> then you come out of the red, you get infrared. Infrared. And then you get microwaves, and then you right. get radio waves. Wow. When you put all that on one page, visible light is this tiny, it's a tiny little, little sliver. Sl sliver. So if you have like a piano in front of you, it'd be like human vision is middle C and maybe a couple keys around yeah. it. That's it. Yeah, barely That's an all octave. All the rest of the keys. Not quite an octave around now, middle C. So are that there any... Sense. So imagine listening to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony which is like three hammered out with three on keys. keys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very wow. boring. Yeah, mm -hmm. That's terrible. Yeah, so we're basically blind. So he did the right I thing. I hate my eyes now. I know. No, no, no. <laughs> God, I hate my eyes. Uh, so let me ask you this then. Are there any animals uh, that see... Oh yeah, outside yeah. of the spectrum. Deer? Oh yeah, uh, and deer. Deer can see a little bit in ultraviolet. A little ultraviolet. Yeah. Insects yeah. are told all about Insects, ultraviolet. Right. Bumblebees. Yeah. Cool. yeah. yeah. Bumblebees and you know, and see them yeah. ultraviolet yeah. as well. Oh uh, yep, a little bit. And you know that they like ultraviolet. Okay. This is this is how we know we are smarter than insects. Okay. Okay. All Evidence right. we are smarter than insects. All right. Okay. Cool. We no know. one is stepping on us <laughs> to kill us. <laughs> we, no, go ahead. <laughs> we we invented bug zappers. 
which are intense and ultraviolet. Ultra violent. And they, so hey, they say, I can't stop it. Right. Zap. Exactly. And that's how we know we are smarter than they are. Mm. And bug bulbs, which you don't see much anymore. They're right. kind of amber. Right. Mm. They don't repel bugs. Bugs don't see it. So their entire sensitivity to light is shifted towards the blue end into the ultraviolet and it dangles off the other end some red and orange. So it's not that they avoid the red bulb over your picnic table, they don't see it at all. They can't see it at all. Yeah, and if, and if you put a bug zapper at the end of the lawn, right. they all go to the bug zapper. So I just want you to appreciate that we are smarter than bugs. So the alien invasion <laughs> comes and it's bugs, we should just rely on our zappers. Oh, cool. Is that, is that what we're thinking? Right. If they are that, bugs. Yeah, but you know what? Reliable? If an alien invasion, if they were smart enough to get here and we're too stupid to leave here, something tells me they're going to have the equivalent the of a anti- bug zapper for us, <laughs> oh. like, the, like a concert. Yeah. Where we, you know, just like, yeah. oh my God, free concert. Yeah, free concert and good food. Right. And exactly. we'll go. Free concert <laughs> and hamburgers. What? Right. You know, we zap. walk in and zap. Right. Zap. Zap. And no one comes out to tell you not. Not to go exactly because right. everybody got zapped when everybody they went in. Zapped. Dude, that must be the best concert ever. It's been going on for six days and nobody's come out. Yeah, <laughs> that wouldn't be fun. Yeah, we would be putty in the hands of a smarter species for sure. <laughs> All right, next question. All right, here we go. Pinty Bot on Instagram wants to know this since you guys were talking about the different uh, types of light in the spectrum, uh, what is the difference between Chandra X ray Observatory and James Webb Telescope? Is it just the spectrum of light or what What else do they do that is different? Let's start out with the orbit. So what sure, orbit sure. is Chandra in? Um, so Chandra is in a highly elliptical orbit that goes about a third of the way to the moon. Um, Chandra is about the size of a school bus. It weighs maybe 4,800 kilograms, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and on Earth. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Very important detail. On the moon, it weighs one-sixth yeah. of that. You know, okay. actually, interesting thing about Chandra is it was, I'm pretty sure, still was the heaviest thing that the space shuttle ever launched. Really? And wow. the fact that it was so massive um, meant that, and I didn't actually learn this until many years later, um, the fact that it was so massive meant that it was a, a more riskier ride for the astronauts than it mm. would have been with a lighter payload. Right. Um, their abort scenarios, for example, were uh, more challenging, um, but I didn't know that at the time. So, yes. So Chandra was large and in charge, and it was like fortunately it. perfect. Large Everything and went in charge. Perfect to get it up into space. Thanks and to the And so astronauts. that's that orbit. And so James Webb is a million miles on the other side of the moon. Right. So they want that away from Earth interference. Right. Yeah. Uh, so James Webb is an infrared based telescope. And again, different parts of the spectrum were yeah. tuned differently. And so they have their targets. Um, of interest, their objects of affection in the universe are different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but then you bring them all together and you get the right. flow. The, the so flow now picture. you mentioned the orbits. This is a question coming from uh, Chuck Nice on Facebook. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Chuck Nice, Chuck in Nice here in the office. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait, let me just comment about, uh, I, I say something a little more about James Webb. Go ahead. Uh, so, so Chandra's in this big elliptical orbit, so it's orbiting Earth. Yep. James Webb is in a Lagrangian point. Ah. It is a point where all forces that would otherwise move it are stable. Right. And so you put it out there, and it takes very little station keeping to just keep it there. And this is the uh, fa- these famous Lagrangian points are where we imagined you'd build stuff. Right, because you just get all your hardware, just, just load it there. It, right, you leave it just there, and it just hang around. Just, just hang. It's right. the garbage patch of it's the a, solar it's what system. It is. It, it'll collect it. Right. If I need a, a, a bolt or a screw. There it is. Right. Just and floating just hangs, right by. Right, hangs right there. It's, it doesn't fall to anybody's right. surface. Yeah. So they would imagine to be a little more useful than they've turned out to be. It turns out we can make things that are orbiting. It's not that hard because once you bring something up into orbit, it orbits with, with it. you. Yeah, right. yeah. So right. it's not. But uh, anyhow, although I do love the Lagrangian point, like as. As a as a place, like it's you know, a cool name. Yeah. It's a total cool you know? name, yeah. right? Exactly, Lagrange, yeah. Lagrange, yeah. Le- 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 <laughs> 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 yeah. All right, so now let me ask you this: Okay, as these as these orbits happen, are they uh, are they st- staying on a fixed point, or are they observing different quadrants as they move around? So Chandra goes um, a third of the way to the moon at its farthest point and okay. then goes about 16,000 kilometers to Earth at its closest point. So it's this nice elliptical orbit. And it's got, they did that for like optimal observing capabilities so that it has okay. the most time to essentially be looking out at the universe. Gotcha. Um, but, you know. Far away from Earth. Far away from yeah. Earth, mm-hmm. exactly. Um, but, yeah, I think what's really interesting about, well, for one thing, I think it must have gone like 2.7 billion miles, I mean, kilometers by now, over 20 years, which is, mm-hmm. I think, fantastic. And you think about it, like Chandra's never had a day 
day off in like 20 years. Doesn't even have like an hour she off. She works hard anything. for them. Right? I know. <laughs> and how perfect that had to work when it was launched. So anyways, but I'm, I'm not sure what James Webb is doing, but. Right. So, well, it's not up yet. Of course. Well, right. true. At, at the when time of this bo- broadcast. Yes. But so uh, these these things have gyros that enable you to know where you are and where you're pointing. And so you give a, send coordinates up there and you pick out your object of interest and gather data. So there are some, I, I think I understand the point of that question. Mm-hmm. There are some telescopes that only observe one, one patch part, of sky. Right, exactly. sure. And they yes. hammer that for, yeah. and they get That's better, it. deeper data. Kepler did that. Right. right. Kepler was one patch of sky looking, there was a lot of stars, but it was still one patch looking for exoplanets. And because it had to go back looking for variations right. in the you, host star. Right. So one set of data is not good enough. You got to go back and back and back and, and then compare you all the compare different all the data. So right, can, right, right, right. Right. So, and let me take this moment. Let's, let's go over just who these people are. Okay. So okay. James Webb mm. was the, he was head of NASA during the 1960s. Cool. Yeah. And, but he was, the, I think he was the first person who we named a telescope after that was not a scientist. So I think what? there might have been some political stuff going on in the yeah. back in the back room. That's kind of cool though. And I, I kind of like James Webb. I think it was the first naming before launch too, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Normally you name that? you name it after a person after launch. Yeah. Okay. Just in case it, it right, blows up it, or right, something. Yeah, right. That's a bad luck. Then like, you, you you blow your name blows up with, right, the, with exactly. the thing. Yeah. Like Chandra was Axaf for a long time, and Axaf doesn't that. quite roll off the tongue. Mm-hmm. Um, X-ray astrophysics facility or something. X-ray astrophysics facility. Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then it was renamed Chandra after Subramanian Chandra Sekhar, who is a very famous. Famous uh, Indian American Nobel laureate who studied things like white dwarfs and stuff like that. So, Very nice. And he also did. Yeah. So, I, I, I probably have a book. Oh by yeah, Chandra. Yeah. Let me see here. Hold on. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, look at that. Oh, funny. And there it is. Yep. Subrahmanyan Chandra Sekhar. Yep. Uh, radiative transfer. So one of the more brilliant among us who. Okay. I, I'm through. I can't even with you. What? What? I'm just what? done with you. What? What? That, like seriously? What? You got issues? Yeah, I got issues. Because <laughs> I'm not an asshole. This is the crap. No, crap. This, not crap. It is? But this is what you're reading. Yes. You're sitting around reading this. Yeah. Give me this yeah. for a second. No. Here. Give me that for no. a second. What? I can't believe that. Okay, people at yeah. home. Any, I just open any I'm page. Throwing, I'm just gonna wait. Let me. Let me just. Let me just open up. Okay. Here. Here's the page. Oh, 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 I swear read to God. To I'm gonna read. It's not, it's not I'm like read to you. I'm gonna read to you. Bedtime stories from here. It is. Radio transfer. Exactly. Principles of invariance. What is that? I, I, what is squiggly that? line. What is that? Squiggly <laughs> line. Squiggly <laughs> line doodle thing. <laughs> and by the way, okay, so this you, just goes on for page after page okay, so after Chuck, page of this. Some it, of the pages are just nothing but actual <laughs> equations. Just after <laughs> equation, after equation. I have seen Chinese newspapers anxiety. that are easier to understand than this. All right, so, so Chuck, if you write a book like this, you get a telescope named after you. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Unbelievable. So he's wrote several books that really were the definitive word okay. on that on those subjects, and they're still used in graduate school. Yeah, and it was That's a naming contest. Um, we actually had a, a contest for the naming, and it was a teacher and a high school student that picked the name Chandra as the winning entry. Oh, very cool. So they knew. So yeah, right. they yeah, knew. Clearly, they did didn't... some excellent research and did <laughs> not mind the equations. <laughs> so we got to take a break. Okay, we have more questions coming up Absolutely. on the X Ray Universe with Kim Arkan. <laughs> I say it right. It's you French, did. but I'm yes. American. Like, you tried to French it as good. I tried to French Arcon. Yes. <laughs> Kimberly Arcon, Chuck Nice. We'll be back in a few moments. We're back. Star Talk in Cosmic Queries, the X ray edition. And I've got the leading visualization person for the Chandra X ray telescope, Kim Arcon. Kim, welcome to Star Talk. You're a first timer. Thanks. I hope yeah. we get you back. Yeah. Uh, and Chuck. Hey. Always there. Uh, yep. You're there for me. I am uh, I always you, here for you, my love friend. You, man. I love you, too. Okay. Got so what do you have? Um, let's go to uh, these people. <laughs> Chuck. <God. laughs> you just you made this name up. What? Uh, All right, go. Adamaroidia. Adam Adamaroidia. I'm going to go with that. Uh, on Instagram, wants to know, how many more stars can we detect with a Chandra X-ray observatory than we can see with our naked eye? And can we detect exoplanet transits? Oh, good. Well, we talked uh, about exoplanets a little bit. So can I reshape that question? Yeah. I look up at the night sky. The human eye can see about, in the total sky, that is below and above you, about 6,000 stars. A, couple, a few nebulae, you know, with the naked eye. So how boldly different if you could just turn on x-ray vision in a in a chandra sense what do you begin to then notice 
What begins to pop? I think it's more than just the star. So I guess it's um, quality over quantity, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just the numerical number that we're going to be looking at, but m more of a, like t telling about what they are. Um, mm -hmm. So, for example, if you looked at a patch of the sky of Orion Nebula, for example, and you looked at that in It's the closest light. stellar nursery to mm -hmm. the sun. Mm -hmm. All right. It's in the constellation, among the stars in the constellation of Orion. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. You can look at that in optical light, and you'll definitely see a lot of stars. But as soon as you look at an X-ray light, you're going to see the same tiny small patch. You might see, like, I don't know, 1,700 X-ray sources. But those aren't going to just be plain old stars. I mean, you know, not that stars are just plain and old, but you know what I mean. You might see binaries. You might see black holes. You might see other types of, of <laughs> these celestial objects. So I guess for me, it's just, yeah, it's not the quantity so much as the quality of what you're studying. Um, and then you're also going to see diffuse emission, kind of like mm. some of that hot bath um, that those stars might be sitting in. So hot hot gases mm -hmm. right, will radiate x-rays, and you're not going to see that with your naked eye, and you're not going to see it with your regular telescope right. Right. either. Right. 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 So right. the whole new world opens up. Right. Um, another example would be something like Cassiopeia A, the supernova remnant, right? So you can look at that in optical light, and Chuck, you're nodding see, like you knew all about Cassiopeia. Listen. Um, <laughs> Good one. <laughs> what, what can I it's say? A famous one. <laughs> what can I say? Even though it's not like it was a, you know, it's not like it's something that is very esoteric. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, to was, be, it, uh, to a, be honest, a, yeah. a supernova exploded. <laughs> right. I, I forgot the year that that happened, but there's a remnant of this exploded star. And we kind of knew it was there, but now Chandra gives us a whole other view of it. A whole other world. It's really amazing to look at. I mean, you can look at it with optical light from like the Hubble Space Telescope, and you'll see this beautiful filamentary structure. I'm a very visual person, obviously, so I'm like lacking my images. But um, you'd see this nice, delicate filamentary material around the 10,000 degree mark, right? kind of looks like a hollow shell. Mm -hmm. So you can look mm -hmm. at Cass A with um, the Chandrix Observatory and it looks completely different. It's like literally death come alive. It's a solid looking sort of Death come thing. alive. Yeah, it's, well, it's death, Ooh. but it's, you know, it does lead to future generations it's, of it's stuff. It's animated death. Yeah, it is kind Ooh, of way. Yeah. It is moving, Ooh, it's evolving. Just ah. go on. Feeling poetic, <laughs> <laughs> feeling very poetic. Man, I can't, I, I got nothing, I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but it's amazing because you can trace like where the iron is dispersed and right. where the argon and the silicon is and it just makes this incredibly gorgeous nebula to look at. New stars arrive different. from the ashes of that which has burned. That's nice. exactly it. Good. Good. Yeah. Now, can I hang with you all? Like yeah, that. that's very nice. That's poetic. Oh, that was very cool. <laughs> yeah. So uh, is Cassé, I, I always forget, is that the brightest source of x-rays in the sky? Or is there another? No, maybe Sco X1 is. Oh, um, uh, Scorpio. Yeah, Scorpius exactly. X1. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but Cassé is really bright, and it's okay, great now, for Chandra. I, see, now, you had, to, you had to do it, didn't you? you what? What? You what? had to go, you know, I was cool with Cassé, okay? Mm, and then okay. you had to go to Sco. Sco. Uh, and, now, and, and what is Scorpio? And what? Scorpius, the constellation. Scorpius. Constellation. Okay. Yes. Now, I'm old enough. Okay. I'm older than all y'all. Okay. Uh, I worked at the Center for Astrophysics, which is a big x ray place right. up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, oh. as an undergraduate. Nice. Oh, and I know that. for my summer project, I worked on one of the earliest x ray telescopes that were launched. So there was Uhuru, which was an x ray telescope. Right. And, and, and the receptionist on Star Trek. Uh, uh, Uhura, no, yes, that's so your joking. brother. Uhura, Uhura. <laughs> <laughs> but she was not the receptionist, dude. She was a lieutenant, uh, first strange. of all. Yeah, and this is true. And a communications officer. So the first telescopes to go up, they just kind of looked for anything that gave up X-rays, right? And then they created a catalog. Sweet. And you, they numbered the X-ray sources within each constellation. Gotcha. So by order of brightness, and so. In Scorpius, so, the, the brightest one was XO X1. So, so SCO X1 is, but is. And there's also a Cygnus X1 mm -hmm. that, yep. I, that's a good black hole candidate. Yep. Right. And so, there, so the, when you see the X in the one, we got our first X ray telescope. Right. And we got Cass A was named before we, it, we had X rays. Right. So. And so now the detection of those, so, uh, you know. Um, Oh, by the way, those early telescopes, mm -hmm. it was just to know that they're even there at all. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, right. yeah. So what, now so you got Chandra. Chandra, Chandra exactly. And that's what I love about X-ray astronomy is like, I mean, there are a lot of people on this planet whose whole lives have been the length of X-ray astronomy. Like the field is so young. Yeah. I think, I mean, it really got going late 40s, early 50s. And then by the time well, I was- Well, when they had was, detectors, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And by the time I was born, there was a good one uh, detector on Skylab. By the time my <laughs> kids were born, like, you know, uh, Chandra had launched and XMM Newton was launched and now they're working on new generations of X-ray um, telescopes. So Chandra was 92 so. or 99? 99. 99. 99. Mm -hmm. So 2019 is the 20th anniversary. That's yeah. 20, okay. Yeah, yeah. this so summer. Now before that, 
you're looking at images like a hundred times kind of dimmer or fainter. Um, much right? fainter. And Mu- I mean, it started out like looking at the sun right. to just get x-rays from the sun first because it's a nice nearby target. The sun and bright then, enough, you think? Exactly. <laughs> Chander can't look at the sun because it's so bright. Because it's so too bright. Okay, yeah. It would see? like fry Chander off. But I can look at yeah. the sun. <laughs> Never mind. All oh, right. No one should be looking at the sun. How's that? <laughs> Especially not Chandra. <laughs> Um, but yes, and then, yeah, with like Uhuru and Einstein, like all these other missions, it's just been an amazing, like compact amount of X-ray astronomy that's happened in just a handful of decades. But it, it took a normal course of evolution. So it did. you you first got to know, you want to learn that there's any kind of source of X-rays Something at all. to detect, gotcha. exactly. Here, there, there. Right. That right. They're blunt instruments, right? right? Then you kind of wonder what it is. You might do mm-hmm. some calculations, but still you don't know. And the later generations, you say, now that I know they're there and I know what kind of signal it's giving me, let me d- devise a detector that can more precisely measure that right. uh, and or measure something dimmer. And so, you, like you were saying, you, you see the dimmer ones, you right. get more precision in your image. Right. You start making X-ray images. Right. And now Chandra's images are so sharp and beautiful. I mean, when you're looking at things like supernova remnants and it's just so much detail that you're seeing, never mind what the next generation of X-ray telescopes will be able to do. Like a hundred times more sensitive. Will the next generation say... You know, back in 2019, oh. <laughs> Kim thought she had high resolution images. I'm sure. I hope but, they do. But she, she was, she was, she yeah. had nothing. She had nothing. Yes, <laughs> that would be perfect. That would be, that would be the best thing. The best Absolutely. thing. If you, if you were obsoletified. Yes. But better everybody telescope. want that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Should we go another question? Let's, yeah, let's do uh, it. Let's do this. Uh, this is uh, Chris Cherry from Instagram says, what is the next light spectrum we'll be observing in the universe? or observing the universe in. All of them? All the above? Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, I guess it depends on what they mean by that question. If they mean what's next to be launched, I mean, hopefully the James Webb will be the next to be launched and that'll be infrared. Um, And then beyond that, it's whatever's in the budget and what other agencies are able to do. Great answer. Whatever's in the budget. (laughs) Right? That's funny. I I love that answer. That's Great answer. It's true. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) What's the next spectrum? Whatever's in the budget. But but ideally... (laughs) All the light. We want all the light. Right. You know. Very cool. But here's an interesting challenge. Okay. So let's. Um, so radio waves right. have very long wavelengths. Right. And one bit of evidence of that is uh, those who remember televisions that had rabbit ears, they are detecting radio waves as television <laughs> signals, and the length of the rabbit ear is commensurate with the length of the radio wave that it's trying to capture. Mm-hmm. So that's so. Okay. So. Suppose you want to detect a radio wave that's a meter long, or 10 meters long, or a kilometer long. How are you going to detect that? You need a detector that is at least that size. Right. So you can get a whole wavelength in there, or at least half a wavelength. You need some fraction of that wavelength hitting and being able to focus it. Suppose there's something out there that makes a radio wave that is the diameter of Earth's orbit around the sun. Who's detecting that? So there could be phenomena in the universe that is washing across the entire solar system and we don't have detectors that can pick it up. Wow. I do like radio waves. If I had to pick a second favorite besides x-rays, I think it would be radio waves. That's a nice pair of waves right there. Yeah, they really are. They're very complementary. Yeah. It's true, even though they're on opposite parts. They're opposite parts, but But they're they're good. Opposites attract. I mean, it really does. Plus, they're highly used in our culture. Radio waves for communication and x-rays for for medicine. Yeah. 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 Very, very cool. All right. All right. Um, Could there be a... Oh, sorry. Julie H., um, who comes to us at Time Traveling on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And I like that. Uh, She says... Could there be technology like Street View on Google Maps that visits various points, just points in the universe? Oh, that's interesting a great question. question, right? Yeah. Um, so we have uh, Google Mars, I think it's called. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can look that up, googlemars.com, or maybe it's mars.google.com, whatever. Um, that it's almost like like Street View um, of some of the data on Mars, and that's really amazing. Um, getting more three-dimensional, which I think is the point she's kind of getting at there, uh, data of our universe is really hard. Once you're going beyond nearby objects in the solar system and you're going farther out past the stars, it's really hard to get some sort of usable dimensional data on that to then turn into like a 3D model that you can tour in like a street view type of map. So you think you don't do 3D modeling for Chandra? We do. You do? It's just hard. (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> but we do, yeah. Um, actually, I do we have do a, things a 3D not model here. Because they're easy. But because, because they're, they're hard. hard. <laughs> so you brought to show and tell. I did bring something for okay. show and tell. So, because again, a, I'm a very this visual is an audio person, show. which does not help the audio folks. Right. I well, know. It, but, it, but we so, can describe it. Yeah. So it is a kind of globular looking um, uh, structure, and it has. Uh, many different nodes that are jutting out from it. And it looks like a tumor removed it, from somebody's it body. It really yeah, does. So, but there, there's a reason for that. Um, <laughs> if you've ever well, you know, it looks like it looks like fossilized, not um, um, calcified coral. That's oh, what that looks yes. like. Very good. Yes, uh, it does. That good? Yes. Wow, so Neil. Why it looks biological, excellent. though, it's because we why, actually why, used why it looks biological. Mm -hmm. It's because we actually used um, brain imaging software adapted from some local area brain scientists in the Boston area to make it that we use their software. So that's why it looks more brainy ish or biological ish than you would probably expect. That's otherwise. funny because before we sat down, I mm -hmm. picked this up and I said, is this like a firing neuron? Right. And, and right. So, right. 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 Mm -hmm. so there's a lot. Imaging. Yes. Yes. Well, I mean, if you look at visuals from the micro versus the macro, now you're speaking my language because of my biology background, but you can see so many similarities in the way that you process those data. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but what you're holding is a 3D model of Cassiopeia A, our good friend that we were talking about earlier, oh, the supernova remnant. Um, that's so cool. Yeah, 10, 11,000 light years away, and you're able to hold a version in your hand, essentially because of the Doppler effect. Right? So did you 3D print that? Yeah, this is 3D printed. Okay. Yep, yep. So we worked So with, the Doppler um, effect gives you depth information. Right, right. exactly. Okay. Um, so Tracy Delaney, she was a scientist who first worked on this. She was at MIT at the time, and she was essentially figuring out what information was moving away and what was moving towards this. Was she with their the imaging effect. lab? MIT has a big, a no, famous imaging lab. she wasn't lab. actually. This is separate, but we, mm -hmm. we hooked her up with the folks who were working on um, the medical imaging software translation, which was called Astronomical Medicine. Um, and <laughs> That's cool. this like was that. the result. I like that, yeah. that, that hybridization. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. This so is fascinating. Cool. I yeah. love it. So scale is an issue, though, obviously, when well, you're holding mm -hmm. something that's small. This is like four inches across for those listening, maybe. Okay. Well, um, we can do, maybe we'll photograph it. We'll yeah, post, it, yeah, we'll post sure. it next to the, vid, the, but in, the audio. But in, in real life, it's like mm -hmm. the surface area is maybe 40 million billion times the surface area of our sun and planets. And you can toss in Pluto if you yeah. like. It doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, Pluto. Yeah, or toss it out. <laughs> but yeah, right. so I buried my hatchet hard. with Pluto. With, oh, good, good, Pluto good, good, good. good. <laughs> <laughs> only, right, Chuck. only you have to bury the hatchet with a Pluto, mm -hmm. with a dwarf planet. I was about to say planet. with a hound dog. With yeah. a, yes, exactly. <laughs> Bloodhound. Uh, yeah, yeah. All right. Do we have time? For but, one but, let me hear. Let me hear the question. All right. I'm going to give you the question. This is Tom Ricks from Facebook. He says, "Do you think virtual reality will ever allow the human brain to completely comprehend the immense distances between planets, stars, and galaxies, or is this something that we'll never fully grasp?" Uh, we will answer that after this break. Nice. See what I did there? There you nice. go. <laughs> it's called a tease. Nice. It's called a tease. Yeah. This is Star That's Talk Cosmic Queries. Uh, X-ray astrophysics edition. We'll see you in a moment. Star Talk Cosmic Queries X-ray astrophysics edition. We're celebrating the 20th anniversary of the launch of the Chandra X-ray telescope, one of the great observatories up there with Hubble and James Webb and the rest of them. Each of them targeting their their window to the universe. Nice. Uh, I got Kim. Uh, Kim Arcand. Hello. Yes. <laughs> and Chuck. Yes. So uh, we left off. Right. We left people dangling. Yes. Where uh, can virtual reality help us comprehend the the scale of sizes and distances and things? Let's make this a, 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 a more broad visualization question. All right. Part of your job, Kim, is to get people to see things we don't otherwise see. Right. Or to grasp yeah. scale and texture and phenomenon that is not otherwise accessible to us looking in every, at, on our Instagram account. Right. So uh, so what, what role do you see that you play in getting us closer to the universe? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think mostly my job is to just sort of oversee all the various visual platforms that we can take Chandra data to. I mean, we... Oh, it's so not just photographs. Not just images, oh, yeah. Right. Um, I mean, Chandra, one of the great things when you have a telescope that's been up there for so long is you just have a fantastic archive of data to work with. And as technology has developed in other sectors, you have all of these new platforms to try it out with. So we were talking about 3D printing earlier and the idea of what you do with 3D models. You so you got to stay current with all that. You do. And we exploit it in yes. your service. When, yeah, when I started working for Chandra, 
Cassiopeia A was one of the first objects we ever looked at, right? Mm. And it was beautiful <laughs> in, a, in a flat two-dimensional image, and I was amazed. Never would I have imagined, fast forward 20 years, and I'm holding a version of it in my hand mm -hmm. or walking inside it in virtual reality. Like, those technologies were not a reality at the time. Um, so with things like virtual reality or augmented reality, mixed reality, um, data sonification using sound, there are all of these ways to Data take sonification. That. Yes. So add another sense yes. to the interpretation so, of the data. For example, Is this also good for blind people? Exactly. Dr. Wanda Diaz actually has done a lot of work around that. Um, my kind of perfect world would be a virtual reality application where you have the, the visual, of course, but then you have um, the layer of sound that's also spatially attached so you know where things are and then also like a haptic layer so you can actually feel what that vibrations. Means, haptic. So like, you know, when your phone you vibrates. Because haptic is a much touch layer. Word. <laughs> I know. It's called haptic technology. Okay, That's okay. what we use. I okay. don't know. But yeah, it's mm -hmm. essentially by being able to feel those vibrations as you're moving through the, the remnant, right? So there are all these applications, none of which were around. So moving we'll through the remnant. So you we have the 3D model and you become uh, a, a journey, uh, you journey through, through the it. model. Exactly, cool. exploring okay. it. Now, the scale is still hard, Oh my God, hard, they used to have right? that at the Franklin Institute. It was a heart. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. And you, I remember- The living heart. The yeah. living heart. Yeah. You would walk through the heart. Right, so mm -hmm. think of that except virtual, right? But then having cues of sound and touch, and it's a wholly different understanding and experience of that information. Now, going back to the question of scale, mm -hmm. I mean, as soon as you get out of earth size scale and even smaller than that, it's really hard for a human understanding and yeah. relations of what we know. Um, so whether that will actually help people understand and comprehend some of these vast scales, I don't know. And but it, it doesn't. Helps, it, I it, it might help. But here's the thing. It's it's just not. Everything that we see, we we imagine on the scale that we see it, yeah. right. because exactly. that's the scale that's in us. which we that's live. Us. Exactly, and so the scale uh, in which yeah. our senses were forged. Right. Correct. Exactly. Yes. So the problem is that even if you were able to demonstrate it, your brain would be resistant to actually then revisualizing it that way mm -hmm. because you're so used to looking at you know the world through the eyes that you have, exactly. which is like Neil does this thing where he shows, um, which I the first time I saw it because he did it for me, I was like, get out of here. And he showed me just where the moon and the sun and the earth are. Right. And it was like relative it's, to each it, other, relative yes. to yes. each yes. other, yeah. and we just did it with with like a basketball and something yeah. else, uh -huh. and we did it in a regular room. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me, right. yep. like you know what I mean? So even yeah. even being able to see it. In the, it, and those you know. are just planets. And those are right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's, right. So that's much your backyard, dude. We're right exactly. Right <laughs> We're not it's talking about galaxies. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. So, I, yeah, I don't think the, the human brain could ever comprehend those vast scales. It's, yeah. it's just too much. Cool. Yeah. Oh, man. This is good stuff. All right. I, I got another quick one just while we're there. Yeah. Uh, you might ask, you see all these stars in these photos, and you say, will stars ever collide? Well, they do rarely, but they do and they can. And it's interesting when that happens. But up to appreciate how rare that is, if there were four bumblebees in the United States flying randomly, there's a higher chance that two of them will accidentally bump into one one another than for two stars to collide in a galaxy. Oh, that's a good that's analogy. That's a great yeah. analogy. That's a good one. That's four bumblebees. Just four bumblebees. Yeah. Bumblebees. Yeah. So you look at their size and right. the distance between them, that's kind of what you're getting, the size of a star relative to the distances distance between, between right. them. Right. Right. right, right. That's a good one. And by the way, if there's only four bumblebees, we're all dead because yes. there's no food. <laughs> <laughs> there's no food. <laughs> Nothing gets pollinated. <laughs> Nothing. Right. I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> right. Not feel guilty, <laughs> to, dude. <laughs> all right, next question. All right, this is- Before we go to lightning round. Here we go. Jonathan Gallant wants to know this. Hey, it's Jonathan from Edmonton. Uh, how far away from? Oh, um, you know what? We did this already, but I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to you anyway. He he's taking it one step further than the last question as a follow up. We'll call it. How far away from are we from a Star Trek like stellar cartography room like they like they have a, on the holodeck in the, in the next so generation? Like in, in the next generation, yeah, yeah. next yeah. generation, the holodeck. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that question. It's a great question. Um, we are actually just starting to experiment with holograms, oh. but screen-based um, holograms, so not you know just sort of appearing in not the world. Not help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my not only yet. hope. But, but even screen-based holograms. That was really geeky. I mean, <laughs> oh, my gosh. But that was good. Was oh, perfect. my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I didn't so, know you had it in you. Uh, good. It's there. I mean, and I think with like missions like Gaia and others, you know, be, building this sort of uh, nice 3D map, I mean, the universe is 3D. So the Gaia mission right? got 3D data on millions of stars right. Right. In, in, in our galaxy. Right. Our world is 3D. So being able to 
bring some of that 3D nature into a way that we can visualize, understand it, and then explore it. I think it's really important. I really do. And it's awfully fun. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Excellent. I don't even know if we have enough questions left for, for lightning, lightning round. round. Well, we just do it. We can just so, we just chill, chill with them. All right, let's chill with it. This is. Um, mm-hmm. well, let me let me slip in a question here. Go ahead. So, let's can we just go back to basics? Yeah. When you're going to make a simple color image of something that has no color, right? Yeah. And you're using your X-rays to do so. What are your steps? Well, so first we get the data from whatever object it is. If we want to use Cassé as our example. Um, the That's first the, the thing, favorite object of the day. It's yes. just the favorite object. It's actually one of my favorites, mm-hmm. if I want to admit it. But um, we first get the data in. You know, it's uh, When it first comes down, it's actually transmitted and in, in coded in the form of ones and zeros. Then it goes through some software, and then it's translated into a table that shows the X and Y position of the observation, <clears throat> um, the time, and the energy of each of those packets of light that mm. struck the detector during the observation. Then it's like yet more software. Oh, by the way, we could measure visible light in the form of energy, we just don't. The way we do it is we measure it by color. Right. So, oh, this is a blue photon and this is a red photon and we just say it's blue and a red. But if, if we did a Chandra thing on this, we'd say th- this is the higher energy photon, this is a lower energy photon. And the blue would have higher energy than the red. Right. So it's really the same thing, but they have a whole other, the detectors measure this in energy. So the vocabulary and the steps are, 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 are shaped for that. Right, exactly. Okay, so sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I just no, no. Slap that in there. So okay, go. More software, and we finally get the visual representation of the object. And I like to use that word, that term, for a reason, because I think there is this idea that these images of the universe are giant cosmic selfies, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Snap, done, and they're not. They really do take people like me or like whoever um, to do the creation step because it is light that you can't see. Mm-hmm. So then you create the visual representation of the object and then you refine it. You have to get rid of artifacts or bad bits of data. You have to smooth it. Um, you might have to crop in the field of view that you need. And then usually the last step is color. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like to you know, slice and dice an image by energy level, essentially. So the lowest energy x-rays will be assigned red, the medium green and the highest blue, unless we're adding it to optical image from Hubble or Spitzer infrared image. Right, because we'll that means you can't it. take their color. Exactly. Yeah. You have to share. You have to share the color. Sharing is very important. We only have important. Roy G. Biv. You got to, you know, <laughs> spread the love. Sharing is very important. Sharing is caring. Exactly. Sharing is <laughs> yeah, caring. Yeah. And then you compile it together and you get your color image. All stuff mm. you couldn't see. Even right. if it's the optical range, most of this stuff is you can't see because human eyes are so puny. Feeble. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That is incredible. Yeah. That's incredible. So you're, you're actually layering layering this stuff one yeah. on top of another on mm-hmm. that to form the image itself. Right. That's pretty and by cool. The, your retina is doing that. So the cones right. of your retina, right. yeah. they're, they're red sensitive uh, cells, they're green sensitive cells, and they're blue, they're RGB. Right. And light comes in, it triggers one cell or another depending on how much energy it has. But we say it's depending on what color it is, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's an energy thing. It's all about energy. Right. And so you trigger a certain amount of the red, green, and blue. And if it's more red than blue or more blue than red, it shapes what color it turns out to be that your brain interprets. So it's the, it's the, it's the same, same thing, thing as your eyes. Wow. Yeah. Or your computer screen or right. whatever. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, wow. Yeah. If you ever look at RGB instructions in the computer code, Mm-hmm. It's no, just a level I of what, it. how much of one. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest, I have not. <laughs> you know what I go with? <laughs> Default. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you don't go in and program it. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> okay, so uh, the point is, if the colors are, um, you can make arbitrarily any color once you have the RGB. Right. Just a mixture of those three. And that's why, and it only works there with light. Don't try that at home with paint. <laughs> right. You mix RGB paint, yeah. you get mud. You get mud. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Now, I, I did know that. I just. And my don't. boy figured that out. Who? Isaac Newton. Oh. Isaac really? Newton. Yeah. He, he, he knew that people kind of maybe figured that white light can make a spectrum. Right. But he took the spectrum, put it back right. through a prism, and it made white light. Right. And that freaked it's, people out. Yeah. How do you get red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, and get white? White. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, thank you, Isaac Newton. If it weren't for him, I, My boy, I would I, not have had a, 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 a livelihood, gro- not a livelihood, but I wouldn't have been sustained growing up because my father was a printer, and oh, I that's know what that. printers oh, do. Yeah. Yes. They okay. actually take light, and they mix it to create color. CMYK. That's exactly mm-hmm. right. That's exactly mm-hmm. right. And, yeah. that, and that's from that's that exact same uh, uh, principle that you just said. There yeah. you go. Which yeah. Is, I, yeah, that's excellent, man. 
Very cool. Look at that. See how science is a part of your life and you don't even know it? Here I am eating because of Isaac Newton. <laughs> it's a stretch, but it's okay. But that is kind of the whole it's, point of the yeah. show, Chuck. Okay? <laughs> You're acting like that's some new revelation about what we're doing here. <laughs> Okay. Chuck, we got two minutes. Let's see two what minutes. we have. All right, here. Uh, Skynet is aware from Instagram says this. So, so Chandra was originally launched in 1999. How has the technology advanced since it was launched? Do we have better technology 20 years later uh, that is more sensitive? So. Oh, okay. can I ask that differently? Okay. Sure. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Okay. At what point do you say, we've got such better technology, let's drop Chandra in the Pacific <laughs> Ocean. <laughs> <laughs> and put up the better technology because yeah. you're spending money on something that was conceived and designed not 20 years ago, but 25 years ago sure. when it was still on the drawing board. I mean, if you have an embarrassment of riches in that situation, fantastic. But that's not the reality. So we don't You don't yet. have a way better X-ray telescope <laughs> Ready sitting to go in the wing? right there. No, Come on, 20 no. years ago? Well, that's expensive. 1989? Though. It's expensive. The Macintosh was four, five you years old. You have to take turns. <laughs> there was no smartphone, yes, smartphones. Yes. Wow. But Chandra is still cutting edge. It's still an amazingly, it's just an incredible piece of equipment still. I mean, they had to smooth Chandra's mirrors so much. Like all the technology that was necessary to create that has then actually led to all of these fantastic um, spin-off technologies that we get to benefit from every day in medicine, in imaging, in um, the focusing agriculture. Focusing X-rays is a big thing. I mean, it's a huge. Like there was yeah. so much work that had to go into figuring that out. So uh -huh. I feel like we can write off that for a while. I'm just saying, don't put Chandra in an early grave. It's doing beautifully. Okay, all right. <laughs> That's very cool. Very cool. All right. Do we have time for another one? Uh, uh, can I can I end with a okay. story? Do, Ooh, let's story, do it. Story time. Ooh, story time. <laughs> okay. Story time. Yeah, good. Let me get rid of these stupid questions. Okay. I'm so <laughs> okay. So there's there's a guy. Uh, his name is Ricardo Giacconi, mm -hmm. uh, generally considered by among us to be the father of X-ray astronomy. Yep. Okay. And he knew that if you're going to have if you want to see X-rays, you have to do it from above the atmosphere because X-rays don't make it through the ozone and other particles in our atmosphere. So you need something above the atmosphere if you're gonna see the universe in x-rays. Well, if you're gonna launch something, it can't be too heavy, because it's expensive to launch heavy things. It's gotta be light, it's gotta be portable. So he was one of the founders of American Science and Engineering, a company based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, that pioneered small portable x-ray detectors. When was this? In the 1960s? Mm. What was going on in the 1960s? Oh. They were hijacking planes to Cuba. People were taking guns on planes. Congress said, we need a way to stop guns getting on planes. We need x-rays <clears> at <throat> airports. Bam! We have American Science and Engineering providing the first x-ray detectors at airports, enabled as these portable devices because they're trying to put them on a satellite into orbit. Wow. And he would ultimately get the Nobel Prize as you, uh, at yep. Kim had uh, yep. introduced him earlier in the show. And I was on the committee, the presidential committee that awarded him the Presidential Medal of Science. And when you get the Presidential Medal of Science, everyone goes to the White House. So I get invited to the White House. Mm -hmm. And here comes Ricardo Giacconi to the White House to get the Presidential Medal of Science. And you go through the security house mm -hmm. before you get into the White House itself. and. What does he walk through? An American Science and Engineering metal detector. Wow. And it was like, And, did, and does he have a like metal hip or a plate in his head? No. <laughs> that would be awesome. And then they <laughs> tackled him to the ground. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just thought that was, that was so, yeah. so, it brought closure yeah. to the fact that the president is being protected by technology that he helped pioneer, and he's getting the President's Medal of Science for having pioneered just that. X-ray astronomy is a gift that keeps on giving. Well, there you go. And we, I tell that story in, in Accessory to War uh, mm. with my co-author, um, Avis Lang. Nice. And just, it's, the, it's astronomy technology affecting security. It's one more way where our penchant for trying to destroy one another has led to a modern day marvel. <laughs> <laughs> Happy note. <laughs> <laughs> we got to end it there, Chuck. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so Kim Arkan, thank you for coming on Star Talk. Yeah. Your first time. I hope we can get you it's again. Fun. You're not, you're not yeah. that far away. You're in, no, not at You're all. in Providence. Yep. Uh, Providence, Rhode Island. Indeed. Yes, yes. And yep. so it's great to have you on the list. Thanks. Chuck, always good to have you. My pleasure, Neil. You've been listening to, possibly even watching Star Talk, Cosmic Queries X-ray Astrophysics Edition. 
I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and as always, I bid you to keep looking up.